Yeah, thanks for the help with uh, setting this up. I should maybe first say this is uh, actually a long list of author, authors, actually longer than what we had in the abstract because that was limited to, to 10 names. So a large number of individuals have contributed from uh, ETH, Meteor Swiss. Uh, and from ETH we have uh, actually interdisciplinary contribution from our institute and computer science and also CSCS. Now, some of the key issues have already been mentioned in previous talks, namely that, oh, we see that we don't see the title of the slides. I'm not sure whether we can do something <laughs> on that. Well, uh, so basically what, we, uh, what I show you here is that the global warming uh, is very sensitive on, on uh, or is very uncertain, and it, there are two uncertainties. One is, I would call it the political uncertainty, namely which of the future scenario we pick, whether it is a heavy mitigation scenario or kind of a business as usual scenario. And the second one, and, and we cannot do much about that, and the second one is a scientific uncertainty, namely within each of the scenarios, there are a lot of uncertainties, and actually it's a factor two. If you look at global mean surface temperature, it's roughly a factor two that uh, we are uncertain. And a lot of that, thanks a lot, and a lot of that actually, this uncertainty is dominated by tropical clouds. We've also heard a little bit about that. I show you a few more uh, uh, kind of two arguments why this is important. And the first one, we just look at one of these satellite pictures and pick two cloud structures, one here showing deep convective clouds reaching the tropopause, and uh, here more like shallow convection. And now think what actually this means for the climate system. And so we picked the, the shallow convection cloud, and this is a question. Do you see the difference between these two figures? Somebody wanted to uh, sees the difference. Well, actually the difference is that in the top diagram I have uh, assigned an albedo of about 30%, which is the global mean albedo which, we, which uh, the planet have. And the lower diagram we have an albedo of about 28%. It's just rescaled the brightness of the picture. And it's hard actually to, to see the difference. But the change on, of global albedo from 30 to 28% actually would change the climate sensitivity by a factor two. So if the climate change would decrease albedo to 28% in the global mean, the associated positive feedback would double the climate change signal. So this shows actually how deep, uh, important it is, and maybe we can toggle, yeah, you see, this is 28%, 30%. That is the difference we are after. And, on, and that really shows that this is a challenging problem. And for such a challenging problem, we cannot really just take these low resolution models that have a lot of parameterizations, but we should actually have a thorough assessment that should be based or rely on multiple lines of evidence, as IPCC is always doing that, but uh, also we should try to use first principles as fast as possible, as far as possible, meaning we should use actually high resolution and resolve much of the physics. Now the second uh, diagram here shows a little more kind of uh, scientific undergirding of what I showed before, namely it shows that the climate, global climate, uh, the equilibrium climate sensitivity strongly depends on low cloud reflectance, meaning uh, those models that, for instance, number one or two, that have a, a low climate uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity have actually a damping feedback, meaning with climate change we will have an increase in cloud cover. While the models with a strong or a high climate sensitivity, they actually have an amplifying feedback, meaning these models, they reduce cloud cover uh, from 32 watts, direction 28%, uh, 32%, yeah. And so this actually shows how important it is to get these uh, feedbacks correct. Now, before I specifically will... will uh, so we have seen now one point, namely that it's a key actually to, to go towards high resolution. The second point is really, can we actually, can these models do something uh, more realistic? Uh, how realistic are these models? And to show you that, I show you some results from our simulations. I will show you results from this large domain which uh, we have used in the study of David Leutwiller, which has just recently been published. And uh, so we are looking over the European continent, and the European continent is a useful tool, or useful area to look at that, in particular in the summer season, where we have a lot of convection. 
Okay, now I hope I can find. Oh yeah, here we are. Okay. Now you see the a three day animation of convection uh, uh, over Europe. Uh, it's repeated uh, continuously. And so you see that every day convection is picking up and decaying in the evening. So it's a good laboratory for investigating deep convection. And uh, some of you actually might also have seen this morning was a good laboratory to investigate convection. This was actually the convection that some of you, I'm sure, did more than observe. Observe with your skin humidity sensors uh, this early morning. Yeah, and actually this uh, this was a really heavy event. The one hour had uh, 47 millimeter of precipitation, and probably in the last 12 hour we got uh, more than 100, and meaning that actually we got a monthly mean in 12 hours. Now this was our Lago di Lugano. Here you see another system where you actually. This is taken over Lake Constance, where you see the structure maybe much better than one was able to see this morning. And you see these rain shafts and also the propagation of the cold air pools, which you see here at, uh, near the sea surface. And the benefit to have a visualization of that is due to the large amount of ice crystal, graupel, and snow which we have in these uh, clouds. Now, to look at this small system on the European domain, Oops, that was probably this button here. We use uh, the GPU version of the Cosmo code, and this has been a large effort led by Oliver Furrow from Meteor Swiss. Uh, and so this code runs entirely on GPU, and it has been really completely restructured, the dynamical core actually rewritten, and it's also used uh, op for operational NWP by Meteor Swiss. Now we run it on this uh, large domain, uh, which we call here the ETH domain. It's 2.2 kilometers, 1,500 times 1,500 times 60 grid points. It's uh, uh, 12 kilometers. It's driven by an intermediate 12 kilometer simulation, to, and uh, it actually shows how fast these codes need to be because it has a time step of 20 seconds. But with this time step, we would like to integrate 10 years, or we do actually, and uh, it. Uh, runs actually on the GPU, so we have a domain decomposition, 12 times 12, so we actually use only a small fraction of the hardware, and uh, it's very fast code, so we can run about one day in 10 minutes. I'll show you a few elements of it, so what you will see in the animation is a visualization of the clouds, as you see here, plus the color will show you precipitation, small intensities in bluish and high intensities in reddish colors. So I try to animate that here. So you will see three low pressure systems running through our domain. Should be starting in a moment. The first one about in coming now, it comes in at the left upper end, reaching the UK. Now you see the formation of a very strong cold frontal system actually a uh, line convection. Now you see a nice wrap up of the core of the cyclone. Now the next system comes in and it undergoes a explosive development right now and you see how the European continent is affected by the formation of deep convective clouds. So this cold front actually decays in the number of convective cells. Now the next one, that's a much weaker system, but you see some nice wrap up events in the northern portions of the domain over the UK and Scandinavia. You can also see how this cloud animation actually that these systems produces looks fairly realistic. So I think even for a hobby metrologist at least, I think it would not be so easy to distinguish a true satellite picture from what we see here. Now, one thing is that these uh, big domains, actually, for the first time in my career, we are doing simulations which are large or give, have more grid columns than we have pixels. And so to really visualize the details, we have to zoom in. And I show you that in a very quick sequence. So here, this would be 50 kilometers, uh, the cold front. And, and actually, this is comparable to what we do today with climate models. Then here, the, these global climate models, here is the, at around 12 kilometers, and I must say this is higher resolved but has the same problems, namely that we don't account for the processes that hold the scale collapse in this cold frontal system. And this is now at two kilometers. I'm not sure whether you, 
it's good enough for you to see the details, but uh, if one can see it, I think this is this cold frontal convective band, line convection, which is only maybe five or 10 grid points large, and which generates precipitation amounts in the upper tens of millimeter per hour. And so what you see here is that this cold frontal band is not aligned to the cold front, but is actually oblique to this cold front. And you see that it's actually broken up into different pieces. And uh, this is something we are familiar with from observations. You see here uh, some radar pictures taken over the Pacific, but we see it, there are also some observations in the literature uh, that show this over the Atlantic. Now, I should say that this uh, system, uh, this kind of modeling system, we think we can do with a very fast speed also on a global scale. And I show you just a few slide for motivation for that as well. So uh, the idea is to use, exploit this weak scaling. So if we actually focus uh, in a domain like that, we would use, uh, could use four times, uh, the domain decomposition of four times four. And uh, so we know from this recent work, actually, that we can scale this code to many thousand Cross, uh, one notes, and the scaling is essentially perfect, it's almost perfect, meaning we can easily go to the European domains, 144 no nodes, and actually these two simulations will use the same wall clock time. So it's the same time except that we have to increase the number of nodes from 16 to 144. And one can continue to do that because this is only 3.2% of bits timed. So we actually use only a very small fraction of the computer. And uh, so if we get the whole computer in a dedicated mode, one can do these kilometer scale simulations uh, on, uh, on the sphere. And this is uh, just a visualization of some of our results. There has been a detailed poster about that. And so here we use actually a, a very high resolution a total number of grid points is uh, 3.5 times 10 to the 10. What you see is a baroclinic wave with three low pressure system, whitish color show clouds, bluish color hydrometeors, and the lines, the, these lines here show the sea level pressure. Now we can actually, it was interesting to do this experiment also from beyond the scaling, which we did it primarily for, but it was interesting because we found something which is a, which is a secondary instability of the cold front. And if you look carefully, you see some of it here, but uh, you can also see this here, which is the relative vorticity now plotted actually in the core of the cyclone. And here you see the vorticity along the cold front. And so the, this vorticity band becomes unstable and wavy, and in the end breaks up and individual warm core vortices form. So we, and we have also simulations that actually show this kind of uh, situation. Uh, there are observations uh, from satellite picture that show that this kind of instability occurs. Also, it is not uh, too frequent, apparently but we can simulate it here. And you, it's actually interesting to point out that this uh, instability does not emerge until one uses a resolution of about five kilometers. Okay, now I should mention, oops, here, well, yeah, that actually if we do these simulations at two kilometers roughly, then we can actually do uh, we require 17 minutes per simulated day, and which shows that the scaling works very well. Actually, we, we uh, don't use, uh, we, we actually can do these simulations in the same time as we can do the European scale simulations. Now, the difficulty that we come with next, and it's the main op objective of this presentation, is the estimation of the high resolution output and how one can deal with this output. And here we estimate the output loads from two, from two approaches. The first one is to upscale the volumes from these classical IPCC CMIP-5 simulations. So the simulations that have been done for the IPCC report. And so these simulations are typically done at the resolution, have 40 level, and pro produce 40 gigabyte, gigabyte of output per year of simulation. And so if you scale this to a kilometer, you end up uh, 0.8 petabyte. 
Second opportunity to estimate the output of a global convection resolving model is to upscale from our SIA CLIM simulations, from these European scale simulations. And so David in his simulation using 0 0.02 degrees latitude resolution and 60 levels produced 5.2 terabyte output per year. And you can scale this up to the, the same resolution as up here and you end up roughly two petabytes per year. And so actually both uh, approaches give the same, both these scaling approaches that we actually require or would like to look at an output of about 1.2 petabyte per year, roughly. And if you think of 100 years, uh, IPCC simulations, then uh, this means about 180 to 360 petabyte. And so here, I, those of you who are familiar with these kind of figures, they will immediately say this will not happen. Actually, this is the size of the ECMWF archive. And so the archive has been written in 30 or 40 years, and, and so here we just request it for one individual simulations that will, of course, not work. And one can also actually point out that it's really the I.O. bandwidth, which, which is the critical bottleneck, because writing this at 30 to 100 gigabytes per second speed would actually require 20 to 140 days. And so even just analyzing this load of data will become impractical if you do this on a global scale. And so what we do here actually, because we have this much higher resolution, one would like to do that even more in a more sophisticated way. I show you an example here from uh, Stefan Rüdisüli, another part of our SIA-CLIM project. So what you see on, hopefully we'll see in a moment, is on the top the animations of the raw output, meaning precipitation, uh, cloud cover, uh, theta E, moist potential temperature. And so you see the formation of a cyclone. And in the lowermost diagram, you see the output of a complicated analysis, which is an objective identification of cold fronts. And uh, Stefan Rudisüli does also link the occurrence of this cold front with the occurrence of precipitation. And one would like to do that kind of analysis because we think that with climate change, different elements of uh, precipitation may change differently. You see here how the cold fronts are wrapping up. And so such an analysis will require much more output than we normally actually have, even with uh, semi pipe simulations. So one would like to have uh, to use another paradigm. And the uh, one thing that really comes up clearly is that repeating the simulation instead of storing the output will become uh, more effective. And uh, so the idea, it, it, uh, we have discussed this for some years within the CR CLIM project, is to create and repeat the model simulation. And so the first simulation you see here, and uh, when doing the first simulation, one would restart the, uh, store the restart or checkpoint files, maybe every year or probably even more often, and then one can rerun or do a rerun or re-simulation, and one advantage is that this rerun can be done in parallel. Because, of course, you can start these pieces at the checkpoint files, and uh, that means you can do it in parallel. Of course, if you do it in parallel, then the optimal thing would do, do it to do it on different hardware, and if that happens, then you, one requires a bit reproducible architecture. Because if you don't have bit reproducibility, and uh, for instance, Stefan Rüdisüli follows a cold front, and the cold front goes from one stretch of the simulation to the next, this cold front will change. So for this kind of sophisticated analysis, one will use bit reproduce or require bit reproducibility, and one will also require that if one looks at hurricanes. The second problem is that we uh, require a sophisticated tool actually to get access to this data and do this re-simulation. I will show you a few slides. This is the data virtualization layer that uh, Thorsten Höfler and his group are working on. Now maybe I have to hurry up. Oops, not in this way. I'm not sure what happens here. Yeah. So you see the basics of the bit reproducible code. So, uh, and this is work that initially was started by Andrea Arteaga and Thorsten Höfeler, I should say. 
now continued by Christoph Sharpio. And what uh, you see are the basic recipe that they have been followed. And uh, so, standard, uh, uh, so actually the standard, uh, they, what they figured out and was surprising to some of us was that the IEEE standard actually guarantees repeat reproducibility for some for the standard operations, but it needs careful care when one tries to sh uh, use transcendental function. So there is some shadowing involved with that, and one needs to be careful about reassociation and contraction. So I think I will split, skip, oops, that's really strange, skip here one slide, but go to the results that, they, uh, that Christoph actually could figure out that at least for the die core, the penalty one has to pay is very small. Actually, it's only in the order of uh, a few percent on the CPU and virtually nothing on the, CPU, on the GPU. And uh, even for the whole core, the price to pay is acceptable. You see this in the light blue. So on the GPU, we have maybe 50% more cost for the physics. But given that the dynamics actually doesn't cost uh, virtually nothing, or there's no extra cost for the dynamics, the whole code runs at an expense of maybe 15%. So one can actually come to a bit reproducible code because, and the, the penalty to pay is affordable in terms of the cost that actually we would face if we would intend to store the results. Now the second point is the data analysis and normally, for instance, in CMIP5, the data analysis would use uh, the storage of the data. And so we have here the simulator, which would be the model and the computer. And uh, so the first step uh, would be to run the simulation and uh, to store, then to store the data. And of course, this will produce a lot of output. This is uh, actually a nice visualization from Salvatore. And, uh, and so, and then actually this uh, pile of disks is really stores our data and is the asset that a large group of scientists can access to. And I've shown here uh, actually uh, the pictures of some university to indicate actually that today the analysis of such simulations happens on an international scale, so there is international access to these kind of data sets and, and it's this, therefore important to have this kind of uh, way, way to do this. And so this is what we do today with CMIP5 and CMIP6, but it's, uh, uh, as we have seen, we cannot afford this because this uh, disk would become far too big. Now the second issue, I skip this, is the, the second op option would be to use high resolution, uh, to use actually in situ analysis. And this has also been used in some simulations, for instance, the high resolution NICAM simulation, which have been uh, mentioned previously, they have been analyzed in this framework. And so in this case, one runs the simulation and actually one does not store the data, but gets the analysis or the analyzed data immediately from the simulation. And that means actually that the analysis group is not so versatile as we had seen before. Basically you have to be affiliated with this guy very closely because you need access to the source course code to look at your data. And that means this is not very flexi flexible. It's also the data is not persistent. You have to rerun the simulation, but at least it solves these problems with IO capacity and bandwidth. Now the third aspect which we uh, promote in uh, our project would be this virtualization layer. And uh, so the, here the, one runs the simulation and the simulator but now is a little more complex. Actually, we store some data, not only the data but in particular the checkpoints. And, uh, and so then important is that the access to the raw data is not followed directly to the, to the simulator, but we have an intermediate layer, the virtual, data virtualization layer, which provides access to either raw data or simulated data. So if then the scientists or the group of scientists access the data virtualization layer to analyze the results, actually what they get uh, is they can get some data, but to some extent the, the, the collecting or, or calling for this data will actually initiate a re-simulation. So 
getting the data in some cases may mean uh, re-simulation. And so this data virtualization layer, the basic idea is to, to, to trade time for recomputation against space and time for storing the data. I should mention that the uh, prototype is uh, finished of this kind of system and is currently undergoing testing. Okay, I think uh, this was the last slide. Perfect <laughs> timing. Yeah. So the, uh, we have seen that the high computational resolution is essential to reduce the uncertainty of climate change projections. I, this is a key issue. And the near-term target mentioned in another presentation is roughly to get at one kilometer, and thereby to so resolve deep convection, and ideally to do it at global scales. And uh, we have also argued in this presentation that the climate scale modeling at kilometer resolution is imminent. So we have seen that we can do 10 year a two kilometer covering Europe. We have seen that we could, in principle, run a global model in a very similar scale or, or time, meaning we could do today global simulations. And there are some other activities at other centers. I mentioned here a few. And uh, if I say here similar, uh, I think maybe this is, uh, I think we can say so, but it's clear that not, not all of these approaches uh, reach actually the high speed of performance that we reach with this GPU version of the Cosmo code. Then the IO, when we manage this point, the IO bandwidth will ultimately become a critical bottleneck, likely the critical bottleneck. So repeating the simulations becomes more efficient than storing the results. And uh, there are a couple of technical challenges. And two that we have addressed in our project was the speed reproducible codes across hardware platforms and the second uh, data virtualization layer. Okay, so I should mention there are, if there are some additional results you find on this website from our CIRCLIMP uh, project website, and uh, you find also some the animations I showed there. Thanks. Okay, thank Thanks you, lot. Christoph. Uh, so we are five minutes into the coffee break, but I think there are maybe some questions. Robert? So a lot would depend in this data virtualization layer in how expressive you could be. So if one was, comp it, one can imagine, for example, that it would be very easy to say, I'd like this average, or I'd like this average yeah. conditioned on this, you know, the average of this yeah. conditioned on that, yeah. right? But if one was trying to do feature extraction, yeah. as you showed for the cold fronts yeah. or something, uh, so can you describe a little bit what kinds of calculations yeah. you imagine making possible yeah. in this way and what calculations not? Well, Thorsten can correct me if I overdo the reply, but I mean, the test they took was really, I thought, a crazy test because they do backward trajectories on time steps, meaning they really recreate the data sequence in reversed order. And so that means that uh, actually their data structure, as far as I can understand, can do everything we can imagine. It's not clear whether it can do it efficiently, and that is something we need to test. It, and uh, it uses actually solid state uh, buffers, so it will store uh, the data maybe of a day or two or so in solid, solid stage memory. Uh, and, and, and so there, there is a, a hope that this can be done, feature recognition for instance, that, that can be done fairly efficiently. But maybe, Thorsten, you would like to add something? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but still, that would, would, would be a kind of asynchronous process because uh, you, you, you want to access your data, but then you have to wait for two or three days maybe until the calculation is done. Yeah, well, we, we had to so think not, about not, that as well. So we think we, maybe that should have been one more slide, it's actually how to organize this. So first, I think the nice thing is actually the groups that would like to do the analysis, they can actually submit code. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, not everybody that would like daily precipitation or so, or hourly, we will rerun the simulation for it, but we can have a scheduled rerun, for instance, once every month or once every two months. And so the code will wait then. Yeah. 
until uh, yeah. the analysis has to wait until we rerun the simulation. And, and, and then it comes back to allocation of computing time on a prey system or a pit stein because <laughs> I think you would need, need out of half of the system to do this in parallel yeah. currently. Yeah, well, you know, this is a prototype kind of system that we develop, and it's uh, uh, really done to test the idea. I'm not sure whether we can develop it within this project really into a real climate application, but uh, we, we try to. We will see. Yeah, very interesting. Do we have one more question? Or Yeah, Thomas. And this is consistent with, I think, what at least some of us uh, have uh, believed that EuroHPC should about, be about. We should have um, domain-specific centers or uh, you know, allocations on large infrastructure. This is something that uh, uh, we are discussing also in place. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, the prerequisite for this is that domains have these, what, what I call super centers of excellences or massive centers of excellences, which I think some of you may know, but I propose that ECMWF take the lead in this and, and arrange, you know, gather the European community. Uh, and once we have these domain representations, we can start talking about topical uh, centers and, and the infrastructure for these topical centers. Yeah. It's not a new idea, by the way. I've been trying to advocate for this in the, like 15 years ago in the DOE context in the US, but it never went anywhere. Again, I think because the domains were not represented strongly enough, mm -hmm. I believe now. And yeah. Okay, so hopefully we'll get that. Okay, I think then uh, let's speak or thank all the speakers again.